Now that we've learned to analyze both bound and unbound orbits, we're ready to learn how to use rocket propulsion to make changes in orbits. Let's briefly review what we know about orbital mechanics. The key quantity, mechanical quantity, in determining the character of an orbit is the specific energy, the energy per unit mass of the satellite. And it's the sum of two parts, a kinetic part, which is one-half v squared, and a potential part, which is minus gm over r, where m is the mass of the planet. Now, the... Um, uh, the, the, the value of the specific energy tells us whether we have a bound or an unbound orbit. So if we have a bound orbit, it might be a circle or an ellipse. Uh, a circle has an energy less than zero and an eccentricity equal to zero, and an ellipse has an energy less than zero, but an eccentricity that's somewhere between zero and one. Or we might have an unbound orbit. In, in the case of a parabolic orbit, our energy is equal to zero. Our net energy is equal to zero. We're moving at exactly the escape speed, and the eccentricity of that orbit is one. And a hyperbolic orbit has a speed greater than the escape speed, which gives us a total energy greater than zero, and an eccentricity greater than one. For elliptical orbits, we characterize our ellipses by the the semi-major axis, which is half of the long axis of the ellipse, and the eccentricity, e. And the paracenter and apocenter distances are the distance from the center of the planet to the closest point on the ellipse and the farthest point on the ellipse. And it's related to the uh, eccentricity and to the semi-major axis. Um, the semi-major axis is also related to the energy of the orbit. It's a very simple relation. If you know one, you can determine the other one. And Kepler's laws of planetary motion um, um, show up in the properties of elliptical orbits. For example, Kepler's second law, which says that a line from the center of the planet to the satellite sweeps out equal areas in equal times, shows up as a relation between the radius and speed at the paracenter and the apocenter. And Kepler's third law, as amended by Newton, tells us that the mass to the first power of the mass of the planet to the first power times the period of the orbit to the second power is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. We also have parabolic orbits, which are the orbits which have total energy zero, where your speed at any point in the orbit is exactly the escape speed at that distance from the planet, the escape speed being the square root of two times the circular orbit speed and the eccentricity of a parabolic orbit is equal to 1. And finally, we have hyperbolic orbits. Um, these are ones where um, there's a, a total energy that is, that is positive. Um, and so far from the planet, you would, you'd have some leftover speed, some asymptotic speed v infinity. And there's also a, a, a paracenter point, point of closest approach. And uh, the eccentricity is related to 1 plus rp times v infinity squared over g times m. And the eccentricity of a hyperbolic orbit, greater than 1, um, uh, has a significance because the, um, the eccentricity tells us the bending angle of the hyperbolic orbit, how much the uh, trajectory of the satellite is bent as it flies past the planet. The sine of half the bending angle is equal to 1 over the eccentricity. In our analysis of orbital maneuvers, we'll be making some simplifying assumptions. The first one is, we're only going to consider all of our orbits, um, both initial and final orbits, lying in a single plane. In other words, we're going to be considering a two-dimensional problem. And secondly, we're going to assume that all the changes in velocity of the satellite happen quite suddenly. In other words, the time of firing of, the, uh, of a rocket motor is very much shorter than, than, the, uh, the, than orbital periods and things like that. And that's an excellent approximation for ordinary chemical rockets. But I have to tell you that for other kinds of orbital maneuvers, say those that are accomplished by ion propulsion, this is not a good approximation.
um, uh, then we're also going to uh, restrict our attention to situations where we're going to change the speed of the of the orbiting satellite and not change its direction of motion. So our, our um, rocket motors will be firing along our trajectory, either to speed us up or to slow us down. And that'll, that'll give us plenty to think about. And, and finally then, once we know the change in speed that's required for a particular orbital maneuver, we'll be able to calculate the fuel requirements based on Tsiolkovsky's equation, the fundamental equation of rocket propulsion. So let's talk about what we mean by uh, making an orbital maneuver. So we have some satellite with an initial orbit about a planet. And then at some point in the orbit, we fire the rocket motors, changing the velocity of the satellite. And afterwards, the satellite proceeds along a new trajectory. So before we have the satellite's distance from the, uh, from the, from the planet, r, uh, and its, um, its uh, uh, speed, v. And after we make the maneuver, we have the same r, but a new speed, v prime. It's the same r because the, um, the maneuver happens suddenly, and, and r doesn't change during the maneuver. So the potential energy of the satellite, which is minus g m over r, is the same before and after. Phi is equal to phi prime. But the kinetic energy of the satellite is different because the speed of the satellite has changed. Let's consider an especially easy kind of orbital maneuver. It's the orbital maneuver where we want to escape a planet when we're already in a parking orbit around the planet. So let's imagine that we're in a circular orbit of radius r around the planet. And we want to, for the first case, consider what's required to barely escape the planet. So we want to go from a circular orbit to a parabolic orbit, an orbit where we just achieve the escape speed. Well, it's pretty easy to solve this. If we start out in a, in a circular orbit, we know the circular orbit speed is the square root of gm over r. And we know that if we want to accelerate to the escape speed, that's the square root of 2 times the circular orbit speed. So the net change in speed that's required to escape from this circular parking orbit is the square root of 2 minus 1, about 0.414, times the circular orbit speed. So that is the delta v requirement, which will determine the fuel requirement to escape the planet from a circular parking orbit. Let's see how this works out for a satellite initially orbiting the Earth. Um, so it, the Earth has a GM to about 4 times 10 to the 14th meters cubed per second squared. And let's suppose that the initial circular parking orbit has a radius of 7,000 kilometers, which is well above the surface of the Earth. That's about 7 times 10 to the 6th meters. From this, we can calculate the circular orbit speed. And we find that it's about 7,560 meters per second. And that means that the delta v required to escape the Earth from this parking orbit is just 0.414 times the circular orbit speed, or about 3,130 meters per second. That's the change in speed we require from our rocket propulsion to do the job of escaping from this parking orbit. Now we'll consider a very similar maneuver. We're starting out again in that circular parking orbit, but we want to escape not just barely, not along a parabolic trajectory, but we want to escape along a hyperbolic trajectory such that very far from the planet we have some asymptotic speed left over. In this case, we want to have an asymptotic speed far from the Earth of 2,000 meters per second. How much delta v will we need to go from the circular parking orbit to this hyperbolic escape orbit? We answer this question by thinking about energy 
before we make the maneuver, we're in our circular parking orbit, so we can work out the kinetic and potential energies, and therefore the total energy that we have in that circular orbit. Afterwards, we know the total energy of the hyperbolic orbit. That's just one half times the square of the asymptotic speed. And we know that immediately after the maneuver, the potential energy is the same as before. So that means we can work out the kinetic energy being the difference of the total energy and the potential energy. Here we'll have to be careful because, of course, subtracting off the potential energy means we'll actually add something positive since potential energy is always negative. Once we have the new kinetic energy, we can work out the new speed, the speed the spacecraft has to have immediately after the rocket maneuver. And our delta V is just the magnitude of the difference between that and the original circular orbit speed. Here we go. On the left, we've calculated the potential, kinetic, and total energy for the circular orbit speed. And we find, just as we always do for a circular orbit, that the total energy is just the negative of the kinetic energy, and the potential energy is just the negative of twice the kinetic energy. All right, now we work out the total energy for the hyperbolic escape orbit by finding that the kinetic energy very, very far away from the Earth. And that will be about 2 times 10 to the 6th joules per kilogram. And that means that the kinetic energy immediately after the maneuver is this total energy minus the potential energy, the same potential energy that we had for the circular orbit. And that works out to about 5.92 times 10 to the 7th joules per kilogram. That's the kinetic energy the satellite must have immediately after the rocket maneuver. From that, we can work out the speed the rocket must have immediately after that maneuver, 10,880 meters per second. And by looking at the difference between that and the original circular orbit speed, we find that we need a delta V of 3,320 meters per second. And of course, we now know enough to calculate all kinds of things about that hyperbolic escape orbit. For example, knowing that the point um, of departure is the perigee distance of this, of this escape orbit from the Earth, we can calculate the eccentricity, which is about 1.07. And from this, we can calculate the bending angle and all kinds of things about that hyperbolic orbit. Now, if you've been paying close attention to the numbers, you may have noticed something remarkable. But I'll, I'll explain it to you here. We started out in a particular circular orbit about the Earth. And to just barely escape from the Earth, to reach escape speed, we, we found that we needed a delta V from our rocket propulsion of 3,130 meters per second. But then we analyzed a hyperbolic escape orbit, and there we wanted to be going faster than the escape speed, so that at a very great distance we had enough leftover kinetic energy to be going 2,000 meters per second away from the Earth. And to achieve this, we needed a delta V of 3,320 meters per second, which is only 190 meters per second faster. In other words, that 200 meters per second extra delta V in our rocket maneuver gave us 2,000 meters per second of additional speed when we're far from the Earth, because it gave us enough additional energy to, to be going that fast at a great distance. This analysis of an orbital maneuver always proceeds in the same way. The first thing we do is we determine the change in the energy of the satellite that's necessary to make this change in the orbit. Now, because the potential energy has to be the same just before and just after the maneuver, because the spacecraft hasn't gone anywhere in that very short time, we know that that change in energy is all a change in kinetic energy. And from the initial and final kinetic energies, we can determine the initial and final spacecraft speeds. And that tells us delta V, the magnitude of the change in speed necessary to accomplish our change in orbit. Now remember, that delta V is 
is always positive. Whether we're speeding up or we're slowing down, delta V is positive because that delta V determines the fuel requirements and we're going to have to expend rocket fuel either to speed up or to slow down. There are other orbital maneuvers that we may wish to consider. For example, there's the maneuver of orbit insertion. So we're on a trajectory that's unbound. We're on a, a parabolic or hyperbolic flyby trajectory past a planet. And we want to fire our rocket motors to enter a bound orbit, to enter a circular or elliptical orbit about the planet. Uh, a special version of this would be the capture problem. We want to figure out how much we have to fire our rocket motors, what delta V we need to achieve to insert ourselves into a barely bound orbit. The, what's the smallest delta V we need to, to make our specific energy less than zero? Here's another example. We might simply want to change the shape of our bound orbit about a planet. We may wish to raise or lower our perigee or apogee, make our orbit more or less circular. For example, if we're in a circular orbit around the Earth, we might want to lower our perigee down past the Kármán line so that we will re-enter the atmosphere and return to Earth. That would be a, a change in the orbit. Um, and there are also much more complicated maneuvers. For instance, we can consider the transfer maneuver discovered by Walter Hohmann in 1925. Um, Hohmann was a leading light of the VFR, the Verein für Raumschiffart, the German uh, rocketry group in the 1920s, although Hohmann did not go on to participate in the military rocket development during World War II. And Hohmann considered the following problem, and I'll give you the simplest form of the problem. Let's suppose you're in a circular orbit around a planet, and you want to be in a, let's say, larger circular orbit around the same planet. How can you use rocket thrust to go from one to the other using the least amount of fuel. And Hohmann discovered that the simplest way is also the best. In the smaller circular orbit, you fire your rocket motors to, to go into an elliptical orbit whose perigee is equal to your initial radius and whose apogee is equal to the radius of the larger orbit you're heading for. And then when you reach that orbit, you fire your rocket motors again to speed up again to go into the circular orbit. And that's the, the easiest way to get from one circular orbit to another. And it's built out of two rocket maneuvers. So let's look at an example that will begin here and will finish as part of our class discussion. It's a real-world example. It's a famous orbital maneuver in the Gemini 11 mission in 1966. The Gemini 11 mission docked with its Agena target vehicle, the first completely successful docking of the Gemini program, and then it used the Agena rocket engine for changing its orbit. Now, initially, the Gemini spacecraft was in a circular orbit with an altitude about 300 kilometers above the ground, so that the radius of the orbit is about 6,670 kilometers. But it raised the apogee of its orbit. It ended up in an elliptical orbit with a perigee of 300 kilometers altitude, but an apogee altitude of 1,400 kilometers altitude, which gave Dick Gordon and Pete Conrad the um, record for the highest altitude above the surface of the Earth before the Apollo program. So we want to ask two questions about that. First of all, what delta V was required for this maneuver? The rocket fired for about 25 seconds to do this. What delta V did it produce to change the orbit from the circular orbit to the elliptical orbit? And finally, the Agena engine had a specific impulse of about 300 seconds in a vacuum. And the combination of the Gemini and Agena docked together had an initial mass of 7,000 kilograms. So the question is, what mass of fuel was required to achieve the delta V for this orbital maneuver?
So here's the second example that I want to discuss in class. Um, I've been feeling the need for a little travel, so I decided to start planning a trip to the planet Venus. And where better to begin than one of my favorite orbital mechanics websites, the Trajectory Browser at the NASA Ames Research Center out in California. The Trajectory Browser allows you to find efficient spaceflight trajectories to go to Mars or Venus or other planets, asteroids, or comets. And, um, uh, and you can insert constraints about when you want to leave and how long you want the trip to take. And the, uh, the trajectory browser is very clever at trying to save you fuel. For example, here's an, um, a trajectory that it planned for me to go to Jupiter. It's a little over four years to go. Um, and this, this particular trajectory involves one deep space maneuver and one additional flyby of the Earth to pick up some extra speed on the way to the planet. But I'm looking for something a little simpler to get to Venus. Here's the trajectory I found. It departs the Earth in June of 2023 and arrives at Venus 128 days later in October of 2023. And it looks an awful lot like one of those Hohmann transfer orbits between two circular orbits. This one's a little more complicated because it takes into account the fact that the orbits of the planets are not perfect ellipse or not perfect circles around the sun, but are elliptical, and it takes into account the fact that they're not even quite in the same plane. But we can see that this has a lot of the characteristics of the Hohmann transfer. In fact, we'll be able to calculate a Hohmann transfer orbit between two circular orbits approximating the Earth and Venus, and we'll be able to calculate the delta v required to do that and compare it to the delta v from the trajectory browser, which, um, which is 4.1 kilometers per second. We'll do that in class. So that's the story. The key in thinking about orbital maneuvers is as follows. A change in orbit is a change in energy. You're trying to change the energy of your spacecraft. And if you make a, a, a change in energy by firing your rocket motors for a short period of time, then you're only changing the kinetic energy, because during the time the rocket fires, you don't change your distance from the planet very much. And that means we can calculate the change in speed from the change in kinetic energy required to make the change in energy of the orbit that we want to make. And that delta v will tell us the fuel requirements for making that particular change in our orbit. We'll go over our, um, our examples in class and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll answer some further questions and, uh, and, and then we will be competent spacecraft navigators uh, able to able to determine what sort of rocket propulsion we need in order to make what sort of change in our orbit through space.